that little banner to come up then. Make sure that we're recording first. All right, I got it on my end. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome. My name is Janisha Rodriguez. I'm a third year law student, uh, and I'm also the co-president, along with Genesis Algaba, uh, of the Latin American Law Student Association. We also call ourselves LAWSA, um, of the Seton Hall Law School. So on behalf of LAWSA and the Unanue Institute, um, welcome to Let's Talk Law School, Diversity, Representation, and Minority Student Support. Uh, we also want to give a really special thank you to all of the clubs um, and organizations, both in the main campus and in the law school that have co-sponsored this event. Um, you can see all their logos on the screen. Thank you so much for supporting. And um, hopefully, well, it, it is our hope that this is just the start of a uh, uh, broader connection between all of these orgs and beyond. So this panel is aimed at achieving two very important goals. Um, one is to highlight and tackle the barriers preventing students from attaining legal education. And second, to establish a pipeline like relationship between pre-law students um, and current law students at Seton Hall University. Uh, on behalf of LALSA as Hispanic, Latino, and underrepresented soon-to-be lawyers, we recognize the racial and economic disparities that continue to persist in higher education. And so therefore, it's part of our duty to deconstruct the obstacles that underrepresented students face, not only in law school, but also generally in the legal profession. During our event, we encourage everyone on the call to use the chat box feature to ask questions or share your opinion. Ana Campo Verde, the director of the Latino Institute and her team will be dropping quick survey questions during the, the conversation. There will also be a Q&A at the end of the panel, so make sure you're writing down any questions that come up so you can bring them up afterwards. Um, and please ensure to use your raise your hand option if you'd like to ask a question. So at this time, I would like to invite Seton Hall University's Vice President of Student Services, Dr. Sean Gibson, to say a few words. Thank you, Ms. Romero Rodriguez, and thank you, Ms. Campaverde, for inviting me to provide a few opening remarks. Again, welcome to all of you participating in this important panel. Why is this important? Well, because representation matters. Just a few short weeks ago, Kamala Harris, the country's first woman and person of color in the role, was inaugurated as Vice President of the United States. Previous to this time, I had never seen anyone who looked like me in this role. As an established higher education professional, the possibilities were inspiring for me. One of you on this call today could be our nation's next leader. However, I wanna note that Madam Vice President did not get there on her own. She had a community of support around her. As co-chair of the university's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, we want to enhance the sense of belonging for all on all of our campuses, including the law school. Our strategic plan goal aims to further cultivate and nurture a trusting and collaborative Seton Hall community that educates and empowers all its members to advance equity, inclusion, and social justice on campus and in the wider world. This is especially true for those of you studying the law. If there's anything that gives me hope and faith, it is the next generation of leaders who will not tolerate racism and oppression. I encourage all of you to reach out to me if you have any thoughts or questions and I look forward to learning and sharing more on this panel today. At this time, I would like to introduce my esteemed colleague, friend, and champion of DEI work, Ms. Lori Brown. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Cooper Gibson, and thank you for your kind words and um, words to help us start our important dialogue this morning. Um, as Dr. Cooper Gibson said, I am Seton Hall's uh, Chief Equity, Diversity and Compliance Officer. I've been in this role uh, for um, just about a year, um, but I've been with Seton Hall uh, going on 15 years in March, and it's been a wonderful experience. And I was so honored when Anna and Janisha asked me um, to serve as a moderator on this panel. We have some wonderful panelists this morning that are here to um, speak to you about their lived experiences, as well as provide you with advice uh, for moving forward, whether you're an undergraduate or you're currently in um, in our law school program. So without further ado, I would, I would like to I would like to have our panelists um, provide a brief introduction about themselves. Um, and as Anna had said, um, and also echoing Dr. Cooper Gibson, if there are any 
comments or questions, please utilize the chat function and we'll try our best to um, to answer those questions for you. So I'd like to start with um, Professor Jenny Brooke Condon, if she could introduce herself um, to the audience. Hello everyone, I am a member of the law school faculty and on behalf of the faculty, I welcome you and just want to um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this critical conversation. I teach um, constitutional law at the law school and I also direct a clinic, which for those of you who are aspiring law students may be interested to know is um, your opportunity as a law student to represent real clients with the support and guidance of a faculty member. And I'm also, um, a, the chair of the Legal Education Opportunity um, Program, which we can talk more about later, but it is a um, program that has been enormously successful at the law school and in recruiting and celebrating some of the most talented um, students that um, the law school produces. And so we can talk a little bit more about that later, but thank you um, for letting me be part of this conversation. And thank you, Professor Condon. Next, we will have uh, Ms. Issa Disculo, she is our Assistant Dean and uh, of Graduate Admissions at the Law School. And so I will turn it over uh, to Issa for a brief introduction. Thanks so much, Lori and Anna and Janisha for including us in this opportunity. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all. Um, as Lori said, I'm Issa Deshula. I'm the Assistant Dean for JD and Graduate Admissions. Unlike many folks on this panel, I'm actually not a lawyer. Uh, I am a higher ed professional. I've been in admissions for over 20 years and I received my uh, master's in higher ed leadership and I'm completing my EDD in higher, in higher ed administration as well. But I come to this table with a passion for um, access and equity. I grew up on a small island in the Pacific where only about 7% of our graduates went off to college. And so like many of you was navigating this process on my own, um, but had to board a plane and travel 3000 miles away from home to explore college experiences. So it's fueled my passion to help folks um, find their way through higher ed, hopefully with a less bumpy path than I did. So happy to be here and happy to answer any questions and offer any insight that I might be able to. And thank you, Isa. And our next panelist is the Honorable Caridad Rigo. Uh, Judge Rigo, I'd like to turn it over to you for a brief introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, honoring me and giving me this privilege to present my side of the uh, law school and, and legal experience. Um, I too, as uh, Ms. Sulo, was basically raised in the island of Cuba. I came to the United States and uh, not being able to speak a word of English. So it was a struggle. And this is going back to the 1950s, 1958, 59. Um, I don't think many people around even knew, or the average person knew, uh, what it was like uh, at that time to be in a country such as the United States and being a foreigner. It's where we're all accepted now, pretty much to a certain extent, but back then we weren't at all. And obviously there were two things that I had to deal with uh, being a Latino and being black. So um, it was difficult, but I made it and so can everyone else. Uh, I went to Seton Hall undergrad. I went to Seton Hall Law School and I've been around Seton Hall, I like to say since 1969 when I went there as a freshman. And it has changed, and all for the good, all for the good. Um, I became a lawyer in um, 1977. Uh, I was in private practice for several years. I was in the state attorney general's office for several years. And from there, um, I was, a admitted or appointed to the administrative law courts of the state of New Jersey. And I was there for, been there for the last 20 years. And I officially, officially retired for the second time mm -hmm. uh, this past June. 
So uh, I am now currently the president of my old high school. It's a small Catholic high school in Montclair called Immaculate Conception High School. And I've been the president of that school since June, since July 1st. And that's what I am doing now. Um, and that's about it. <laughs> it sounds like a long time, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, we're honored to have you with us this morning, Judge Rigo. Thank you very much. You. Um, our next panelist is Mateo Diaz. He is a second year law school student at our law school. And Mateo, tell, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Mateo Diaz. I'm originally from Carson, California. Um, moved from Carson all the way to Syracuse, New York to attend undergrad at Syracuse University. I did study sport management with an LGBT studies minor. Now here at Seton Hall, I have a concentration in law and technology with an entertainment and new media tract. My school involvements are uh, I'm vice president of uh, the Latino, uh, the Latin American Law Student Association, as well as vice president of Lambda, which is our LGBT um, plus student organization. I'm also Lexus Nexus student rep, which is one of the um, legal researching sites. I'm also a uh, software, so not so much of a site. I'm also Barbary student rep, which is a bar prep. I'm also an admissions research assistant. So I work in the admissions office closely with um, ISA. Outside of the law school, I'm an at-large non-voting member of the Young Lawyers Division of the New Jersey State Bar, as well as a student rep of the Hispanic Bar Association of New Jersey, a judicial extern for the Federal District Court Judge, Judge John Michael Vasquez, and, and an alumni advisor of the Delta Upsilon um, Colony at the undergrad here at Seton Hall. And as Professor Condon uh, spoke about the LEO program, I'm also a LEO fellow. I hope that's a minute. And that's a little bit about me. Well, that's a long, that is a long and wonderful um, introduction, Mateo. We see how active you are both inside the Seton Hall community and externally, and we appreciate that. And thank you for being on our panel today. And uh, last but not least, Leslie Veloz, who is also a second year law school student at the law school. And Leslie, um, if you could give us a brief introduction about yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leslie Veloz. I am originally from New York City. I grew up in Spanish Harlem. I went to Buffalo, New York at University at Buffalo to study psychology and English, and then I've moved to New Jersey for law school. I am the New York Metro Subregional Director for the Northeast Black Law Students Association. I also serve as the Public Relations and Social Media Chair of LALSA. I am also a Barbary Ambassador here on campus, and I am also a Westlaw representative here on campus, which is the better research <laughs> But that's a conversation for another day. Um, and I'm honored to be here. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your introductions and just want to kind of lay um, a little bit of foundation for our discussion this morning and provide uh, our attendees with some information just about the, the profession of law. Um, so we were able, Anna was able to put together some facts to uh, career st statistics for us, and I just wanted to share that with the panel so that could be a basis for us to start our discussion today. So in 2017, 4% of the lawyers were identified as Latinos while making up 17.8% of the total US population. Um, this is a source from the National Hispanic Bar Association as of 2018. Um, a second statistic is that 5% of the lawyers identified as African American while making up 13.3% of the total US population. 2% of the lawyers identified as Asian American, 1% identified as Native American, and 2% identified as women. And the source of this information is from the Minority Corporate Council Association, which conducts an annual survey uh, from 2016. So just laying the framework for our um, you know, conversation this morning with these statistics, I'd like to ask our panelists, um, and we'll start with, with, uh, with Issa, um, I'm sorry, we'll actually start with, with Jenny Brooke. What inspired you um, to pursue a career in law? 
You know, it's it's kind of quite simple. I think I saw a law degree as a tool for social change, and I wanted to both help individual clients um, with their problems, help them solve problems, but I also saw it as a means to um, support social movements and communities. And I've been very lucky that as a practitioner and now as a faculty member to continue to do that work, but also to have the joy of helping to train the next generation of students um, who are eager to do the same. And some of them may be the next next generation because you may still be undergraduate students. So we're, we are, um, you know, there's a number of us at the law school that are committed to social justice work, but that's not the only um, path a lawyer may take, but that's been my path. Great. Thank you, Professor Condon. Judge Rigo, we'd like to ask you what was uh, what was it that inspired you to pursue a career in the law? Uh, Judge, Judge Rigo, Rigo. I, you're muted. You just have to unmute. Thank you. Sure. OK. Um, it was my interest to to help people. Um, I, I wasn't thinking at the time of a social change, um, but I was thinking of just just helping. Um, I, I'd like that. I, I'd like to uh, make changes in individuals' lives. Um, and that's that's what got me interested. Um, I used to see uh, friends of my parents parents or myself uh, struggling, um, not realizing why they were struggling, but just struggling. And it, it was my interest, I still have it, just to, just to help. Um, and I found that the best way to help was really in law and um, helping change, not necessarily helping change with legislation, but helping in actually doing it, you know, taking what you have and working with it and making it work to your advantage or to work to someone else. So that's what got me interested in law. Thank you, Judge Rigo. And I will turn to uh, Mateo and Leslie, our students on the panel. Mateo, what was it that inspired you um, to pursue a career um, in the law? So um, one thing I didn't mention is that I am a first generation everything. Um, so American college student, law student, um, and soon to be lawyer, right? So uh, my my father's side, Cuban, my mother's side, Nicaragüense. Um, and growing up, seeing all the struggles that my, that my family went through, my dad was actually in prison for over 10 years. And now they're pastors. Both my parents are very conservative Christian pastors. But being able to see that, how all a bunch of legal issues that they went through from immigration to all the troubles my father got into when he was in uh, living his his um, living with his gang and his lifestyle and all that stuff. I know that they could have avoided so much if they would have just had the proper legal representation. And that really inspired me to become someone who I needed when I was younger, um, even through struggles that I went through trying to figure out everything, being that I am a uh, first gen, as well as I want to be able to break that um, that cycle of poverty that my family has just been in since forever. I want to be that first to break that cycle and break that cycle of no education and break that cycle of break all the cycles, right? So I just wanted to, to do more and um, do something that I could be proud of and that my siblings, that my younger siblings and my parents could be proud of and something that my children, my future children could be proud of. Thank you, Mateo. And Leslie, I'll ask you the same question. What was it that inspired you to um, and your desire to want to pursue law school? So I've realized that Mateo and I are the same person. So I'll try not to reiterate everything he just said, but in that same breath of being a first generation American, first generation college student, first generation law student, I've always been 
intimately aware of that my opportunities would be statistically limited. Um, and just seeing how the justice system has historically operated in America, I wanted to be an advocate. I wanted to play a role in dismantling old toxic doctrines and really bringing in a new wave of law and justice um, to really serve our communities better. I think that it's important to have representation people that look like us in these roles to play a role in policy making and just how justice is administered. Thank you, Leslie. And Issa, I want to ask you what uh, drove you to want to work with law school students and be a part of um, the law school experience? Uh, so one of the things that really brought me to the law school admissions world is being able to help students that have a passion like Leslie, like Mateo, like um, Genesis, who's on this call as well, and Cheska and Janisha, so those that have a passion and can make a change and impact in our community, I wanted to help be a resource for them to achieve that goal and help sort of be there for them. I answered Anna's question in the chat about challenges in college, and I went to a predominantly white institution and was always looking for someone who looked like me or someone to be a champion for and with me as I went through and navigated my journey. So to be able to be that for others is something that motivated me to um, stay within the admissions industry. That's great. Thank you all for your your uh, your feedback on this. And my next question uh, would be, as a student of color, how was your experience as an undergraduate student and as a current law student? And uh, let me start with Mateo. Um, with that, if you could share, um, you know, briefly what your experience was both on the undergraduate and as a law school student, as a student of color. So attending, I also attended a predominantly white institution at Syracuse University, and it was a culture shock uh, coming from Carson, California, where it's Southern California, 20 minutes south from LA, um, two hours from the Mexican border. Everyone that I knew spoke Spanish. I was predominantly raised with Mexican folks, uh, Filipino folks, every, everyone, like of all colors, everything. Going to Syracuse where sometimes I, you know, middle of nowhere, uh, upstate New York, where no one spoke Spanish, uh, no one really looked like me, and it was just confusing and scary. Mm -hmm. But um, especially being that I didn't know anybody. I moved at 18 not knowing a single soul in Syracuse, and it was scary, but thankfully, the university had um, their, the, their diversity office and uh, the LGBT Resource Center, and I just met great people who were able to, um, in a way, hold my hand and really walk me through the process and teach me. And if it weren't for them, I probably would have dropped out. Um, so for the students on here, make sure that you reach out to those resources because those resources on campus, be, uh, those offices, those people are there for you. Um, and they're there to help you. So if it wasn't for, for the people that really helped me, even the chancellor of the university who wrote my letter of recommendation for law school, he was a big advocate for, for my success. Um, you just have to make those connections. So if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be where I am now. And coming to Seton Hall Law in the same regards, it's, it's pretty predominantly white institution as well, but I don't have that culture shock that I had when I went to Syracuse. So I'm, in a way I'm kind of, you know, quote unquote, used to it, but the, the same. We have, you know, the diversity office, we have the LEO program, we have all these student organizations and these communities where we're able to, to find people like us and mm -hmm. people who are there for our success. And that has made the difference. If I didn't have any of that, I honestly would probably just, you know, I, I graduated high school with my associate's degree. I would have probably just been at church with my dad doing, I don't know, his, uh, his uh, construction and landscaping and all the other side jobs that he does. So really for all the students, really reach out to those organizations and those, those, um, those people and professionals that are there for you because they make all the difference, honestly. Thank you, Mateo. And Judge Rigo, how was your experience being both um, an undergraduate and a law school student uh, with Seton Hall? Can you describe for us what your experience was as a student of color? Oh, Judge Rigo, you're on mute. I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
As an undergraduate at Seton Hall, I was blessed with having um, one or two professors that really mentored me. Um, one was a Spanish professor and the other one was at the time and a dean or an assistant dean. I don't remember uh, exactly what his title was at the time, but uh, he was working at the Upward Bound program. And even though I was not a student of, I was not a, a Spanish major and I was not an Upward Bound student, um, they, they kind of just saw me and they probably saw the look on my face and how lonely I was and, you know, how um, isolated I was within the university that um, they took me on and actually mentored me um, right through into, into law school. So uh, that was that experience, uh, un the undergrad. Uh, and it was it was good. Uh, when I got to law school, that was a totally different experience. Um, I went to the night program at Seton Hall because economically I needed to work during the day. Um, so it was a night program, which is more isolating than the uh, day program. Uh, the night program at that time, everyone there was first a lot older than me um, because they were all out working all day. And it was, it was new to me in terms of working, uh, you know, producing an income and law school. Law school is, as I'm sure you all know, it's a totally different academic experience. Um, and at the time at the law school, there was nothing like this. Uh, the law school did not even have a BALSA program at the time, and that's the Black Law Students Association. Mm -hmm. um, I think the BALSA program came on when I was in my second year, uh, but I was a night student. So then again, it, you know, you, you're not really integrated into the actual law school experience. So law school was a struggle, but what saved me was um, you had to have, at that time, a study group. And it was the study group that got me through. There was always someone, something there to kind of get you through. And then you also have to rely on your own self-discipline, your own self fortitude, your own self-assuredness, uh, and of course, with the help of your family. Uh, I was blessed to have an excellent, excellent parents at home that uh, were that source. Um, but from the outside, I would say there wasn't very much. Yeah, very much. I could use such as these organizations that um, Mateo is in, that Leslie is in, all of those things. Um, but when I talk about the do's and don'ts of uh, making it through law school, um, I'll mention a few things that you should do and you should not do. Okay. Thank you so much, Judge Rico. And Leslie, can you share with our uh, participants today um, how your experience, both on the undergraduate side and it being a current law school student now, how has that been as a student of color for you? So similar to Mateo, I also attended a predominantly white institution. So UB, just for numbers, we have around 20 to 30,000 students. And from that, about 10% are students of color. So we have less than 500 black and Latino students less than 200 black and Latino students. And I've always been involved <laughs> in middle school, you name it, high school. So college was no different for me. I've always learned that, you know, making friends, being involved is really, that's my bread and butter. So with, uh, when I got to UB, you know, I spoke to my counselor and I was like, I would love 
to be involved with SBA, you know, what's the process like? And my counselor being transparent, I was like, I'm going to be honest, you know, there's students like you <laughs> usually don't get on to student government because I was specifically asking about becoming student body president and they're like, we've never had a Latina or an Afro Latina um, be or a black woman be, you know, uh, student body president. So that's not likely to happen. So my experience was always going against the wind. Um, I was fortunate enough to be very involved and I did end up becoming the first uh, Latina student body president, but it was more about my undergrad was more about breaking ceilings. You know, I can't, I, it's unfathomable to me that in 2020, 2021, anything in the 2000s really, we're still having firsts of anything. Um, so that was undergrad and law school. It's, you know, our, this isn't an industry or a profession that was really designed to have people of color. Um, but with that, I think that Seton Hall does an amazing job of really fostering a community here and having resources available to us. You know, there was no one here that told me, oh, there's nothing you can't do. Instead it's, oh, that's a great idea. How can we support that? Do you have, let's set up a meeting. Let's set up your schedule. You know, have you met Mateo? Have you met Genesis? Hold on, wait, I have Janisha on speed dial. Let me call it, wait, stay here. Don't move, wait, let me look in the hallway. Who's out there? Let me introduce you. And I think that with that, with all of our affinity orgs, everyone wants to see you win. And that makes the world of a difference. You know, even if I'm here at 1030, if a 1L come up to me and ask me any question, I'm like, do you have an outline? Have you met so-and-so? This person got an A in this course. You should really talk to them, you know? So it's, I love that familial, collegial aspect here. So law school is a little different. Thanks, Leslie. And I love what you just said about going against the wind. I think that, um, Everybody here on this call being here today, you're going against the wind. You're trying to find out ways in which you can um, possibly think about going to law school or if you're in law school, what that's going to look like when you when you graduate. So I think that's a great phrase that you um, that you gave to us this morning. So thank you. Um, I want to move to a, a, a little bit of a different topic here this morning, and we want to talk about the landscape of the legal profession. Um, and I'd like to talk to um, and ask questions about uh, from the perspective of of Isa. What do you see as some of the barriers that could be um, possible for entry um, for students of color? What do you think are, are are some of those barriers? So when I think about some of the barriers to entry, particularly for uh, our diverse candidates and students of color into law school, there are a couple of things that come to mind. The first, and I think some of us have already alluded to it, is the lack of guidance in the overall process, right? So many of us are first generation college students, never mind first generation law students. So we're not always aware of the process and we're trying to figure it out on our own. So as a result, um, as an admissions dean, I see a lot of these students sub submitting their applications a little bit later in the process um, and sometimes in a way that doesn't always reflect them in their best light. So that's a, a barrier that I've seen. I've also talked a little bit about this and that's the lack of role models um, around us that might look like us, right? So we don't always have lawyers in our family that we can turn to and ask, you know, what was your process or what what should I do or why did you want to be a lawyer? Uh, for most of us, sometimes when we interact with lawyers, and I might be dating myself, but when we interact with lawyers, sometimes it's not always in the best light or it's usually in a challenging circumstance. And that might be the reason that might be motivating us to pursue law, but it's not enough to show us how to achieve this dream and tell us the path that it takes. Um, the biggest barrier that I see, however, um, particularly as an admissions dean, is in the academic preparedness. So many of us may not have always received the right guidance early on in our educational experiences. Um, everything is about foundation. So I'm not just talking about college, but I'm talking about things that build us up for foundation, um, you know, successful foundations. So 
good elementary schools lead to good middle schools, which leads to good high schools, which prepares you for acceptance to a good college. But we don't always have the opportunity or aren't always in the situation that have found us um, in those uh, communities or be able to achieve that. As a result, sometimes we find ourselves trying to achieve competing goals and that might impact our overall academic performance right many of us need to work in order to support our, our family financially and that can take away from some focused study time um, in in high school in college focused study time on the lsat or the gre um, so again as a result so you see the domino effect i feel like of all of this as a result um, we're seeing some weaker LSAT or GRE scores coming through from this particular population. And we all know that commercial preparatory courses are not cheap, right? Um, the, the Kaplan's and the Princeton Reviews of the world, they're not cheap. There are some really good free resources out there, I think more so now than, than um, even during sort of Mateo and Leslie's time with Khan Academy coming through with LSAC. But these free resources require you to A, have the time to dedicate to do this on their own, and B, have the good discipline and study skills to say, no, no, today I'm going to study this, or for two hours I'm going to do this. So you have to be able to be accountable to yourself. Um, and, and finally, one of the other barriers that I'd like to talk about is financial. Um, preparing for law school and applying to law school is not a cheap endeavor. Applications have a fee, LSAC account has a fee, and LSAC is the clearinghouse for all law school applications. Um, standardized exams aren't free, preparing for them aren't free. So um, students really, and it goes back to sort of the guidance, right? Students need to be aware that there are ways to, to combat this and that there are resources that they can acquire at, such as fee waivers or um, scholarships in order to achieve this. But not having the guidance, not having the role model sometimes um, really permits us from doing that. And then the, the final financial barrier is that you might get accepted to law school and you're super excited, but then how are you going to finance it, right? For all intents and purposes, law school is a four to five year financial investment. Mm -hmm. um, it's a three year investment if you're a full time student, a four year investment if you're um, a part time weekend student. But then you got to think about that fourth or fifth year, which is preparing for the bar. Right. Yeah. So it's really about um, those barriers. And, and as you, as I was talking, you see that they're sort of these domino effect barriers, right? They all affect each other. And so it compounds the situation. And so seeing some of those, um, those are some of the barriers in particular as a dean of admission that I've seen um, for a lot of our diverse candidates when they apply to law school. I'm sure there are many others. I'm sure some of my colleagues on this panel face others, but as a Dean of Admissions, that's what I've seen uh, in my experience. Thank you, Issa. And Professor Condon, I just wanted to ask you from a faculty member um, perspective, um, and if you've had the opportunity to serve on um, admissions committees, what do you think are some of the um, factors or elements that admissions committees like to see or are interested to see in our in our applicants as applications come across um, the committee's desks. So I could speak to that specifically from the perspective of the Leo admissions process because I think um, that's um, a great innovation from how law schools maybe traditionally look at the admissions um, picture, which is very mm -hmm. limited based on just numbers, you know, what your LSAT score is, what your GPA is. And I think the idea behind LEO um, and what more law schools should be doing is realizing for all the factors that Dean Disculo mentioned, that people might be working full time, might be responsible for children, might be taking care of family members, might be dealing with um, poverty or illness, there might be all these other factors that are part of the picture. So I think what the LEO Admissions Committee endeavors to do is to look below the numbers and to look for those signs of strength and potential and talent. And we see that 
um, beyond just an LSAT score in terms of um, students um, demonstrating leadership skills like um, Leslie uh, clearly would have jumped off the page as somebody who who demonstrated those leadership skills and Mateo um, the way that he thrived at Syracuse and had may maybe and I'm not don't know uh, Mateo's picture but I imagine you know for some students there may be a um, period where there's a transition and maybe you're trying to find your path but when students do find their path and then they've they are on their way to success that should matter more than you know the number that they end up with. So I think the Leo Admissions Committee is looking for an understanding of the systemic inequality that exists in the education system and in our society that mm -hmm. factors into um, the admissions picture. That's part of it. And then after recognizing and seeing those barriers, thinking about individual um, uh, talent, demonstrated skill, and the potential to be a great lawyer. And so it's a really wonderful um, process to be involved in to, to try to um, see all of that um, potential. Thank you, Professor Condon. And I wanted to ask my next question, um, directing this towards Leslie, uh, uh, Judge Rigo, and to Mateo. Was there ever a moment um, whether it was in your, your undergraduate career or your law school um, career where you felt that um, you were underrepresented in the classroom or may have experienced some type of imposter syndrome. Um, I know that, and I, I'll just share this with you, when I was in law school, there were at times, um, you know, you, you questioned, you know, um, your being there. Um, I, I took a few years off after undergraduate and I worked for a little while and actually worked for um, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund um, in their voting rights project and in their employment litigation section. That's what really um, was the turning point for me to make my decision to to attend law school. But have you ever in your, you know, f felt that way or felt um, um, that that maybe you're being a student of color impacted um, your experience? And I'll start with Judge Rigo. Thank you. I already unmuted myself. <laughs> um, I felt I had no problems at the undergrad, uh, Seton Hall undergrad. However, when I got to law school, it was a different world. I certainly felt many, many times that I probably shouldn't be there. Um, and it was, it was more from the standpoint of my, my classmates. Um, it was basically, I'm going to say, all men, all, um, a few blacks, not many, but all men. Um, they were all dressed in traditional business suits because they all came from their very high grade business uh, jobs. Um, I went to school with uh, vice presidents of banks, uh, people on Wall Street. Um, again, it was night school. It was generally the um, older, well, not older, but certainly well past undergrad and here I am just out of undergrad came right into law school into a night program and um, they had experiences from their business world that they could relate to whatever we were studying um, and I couldn't um, I had to work almost to to their level and then to the professor's level to what the course required because I did not have any experience you know um, my parents were not white collar workers um, um, my parents weren't home discussing the stock market market and what was going on in business so I couldn't relate almost I couldn't relate to anything, not almost to anything, where my classmates could, and they could bring those thoughts and that thinking and that process into the classroom. And um, I found that 
most difficult um, because whatever I said, I had to speak and talk, and it may not have been wrong. It was probably quite appropriate, but when you've got 20 other people talking at it from a different level, mm -hmm. and I'm talking more from the academic level or from whatever it was that I read, um, some I felt anyway that I just wasn't going to be able to compete. Um, and that if I had a group such as the groups that you have now, um, at least I can go into that meeting or that group and say, you know what, blah, 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 blah. And they could tell me, well, I had the same thing or didn't, or I said this and this is how. And but I had no 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 one to relate to because as Mateo, I was the first in everything. Um, so I didn't even have siblings because I'm an only child. So it's um, it was difficult. And that's another thing that I would talk about in terms of what you need, what you need to do when I talk about the do's and the don'ts. And we will definitely get to those do's and don'ts before we uh, conclude our our panel discussion today. And Leslie, just want to um, ask you the same question that I asked Judge Rigo. What about yourself in terms of um, have you ever faced um, being um, subjected to that imposter syndrome experience of, you know, whether it was un in, in your undergraduate experience or in law school? Absolutely. So it in undergrad, even though I was being told no, I took it as a challenge and I always saw there was always representation. I could always see it. I could always see 10, 15 people, friends in the hallway as well. In law school, similar to Judge Rigo, I also have that dual identity. I identify as an Afro-Latina, so I am both Hispanic and Dominican, and I also identify as Black. And in my classes, I'm always okay. I am the only Black girl here. And sometimes in others, it's like, okay, there's another Latina. They, you know, there's just one more. But sim in classes, same, you know, my parents were not white collar, um, you know, always working class. And it'll be even in my property class. You know, the first day of class, my teacher asked everyone, who here owns property? Mm -hmm. I'm from New York City. Oh, you don't own, we rent. <laughs> but, you know, there were several students that rose their hand and were the same age. And I'm like, wow, they own a house. They own a building. They own property. You know, this is something that, similar to what Mateo was saying, I am looking to build generational wealth and change that narrative by my family. I know that's five, 10 years once I've made it and I have a big girl job, you know, so you can't help but realize and feel being other when you don't see it and you can't relate to the conversation or to the experiences because that's just another thing that disconnects us. There's so many experiences, you know, I know how to do my laundry, you know, I know how to cook because I had to, you know, so different things, different experiences. I feel it every day. As involved as we are with all of our roles, we feel we always have to work against feeling like an imposter, which is why we're here. We would love to see you all apply and get in <laughs> so we can build you up because we're standing on the shoulders of everyone that came before us and we're here to help. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was a, a wonderful. Uh, thank you for that inspirational response. Mateo, I'm going to ask you the same question and, and share with your experience with us. Um, uh, see if I, okay, great. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. I feel, I felt and sometimes still do feel like an imposter. And I think it's just something that, that, uh, comes with the territory, um, which it shouldn't be. And I hope that one day we get to a place where it's not a thing, but 
one thing that I didn't mention about my undergrad, which I kind of chatted in the chat, is that I don't I, I mentioned my parents earlier, but I don't have their support being that in undergrad, I did come out as trans and going through that whole process of coming out in undergrad really, you know, sent my very conservative Christian pastor parents to the side because they didn't support me. They don't support me still to this day, even though I'm in law school, even though I'm doing so much more with my life than they ever could. And I still want to give back to them because they're still my parents. So being in undergrad all the way on the other side of the country where I knew no one, going through these struggles of, of finding myself, having my grandmother pass away on the other side of the country, trying to deal with death and myself and trying to be the only person of color and the only trans person in my program. I was in the sport management program where it's all, you know, cis, white um, men and me coming out and my professor not really knowing how, what to do with me, really. Like, um, I had one professor, um, I, I was wearing shorts once and, you know, my hair, my, my legs are hairy and she reached for my leg and go, oh my God, look at this hair. And I'm just like, don't touch me. <laughs> like, what's going on, right? So having to deal with things like that in undergrad, trying to figure it out, my studies really suffered. And I graduated with a 2.3 GPA. I should have graduated in three years because I graduated high school with my associate's degree, but it took me a full four. So having to figure that out and trying to really figure out if I matter, if I'm worthy enough, if I'm supposed to do something that's better than or bigger than I am really was a struggle. And I did take those two years off after undergrad because I gave up on myself. I said, you know what? I'm just going to go find a job. I have a bachelor's. You know, no one, no law school is going to take me with that GPA. What am I going to do? I'm just going to go find a job. But um, if it wasn't, uh, one of the best things I did was join a fraternity. And, you know, a lot of people hear the negative sides of fraternities, but my fraternity really built me up. They accepted me for who I am. They really saw me for who I am. And one of my alumni, he graduated in uh, 87 at Syracuse. He's a big partner in the D.C. firm. And since day one, he goes, Mateo, you're going to be a lawyer. I didn't tell anyone I wanted to go to law school. No one knew because I gave up on myself. And he told me, you're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a lawyer. He kept bugging me, kept bugging me. And it took him telling my, my girlfriend at the time, your boyfriend's going to be a lawyer for me to sit down and talk to her and say, you know what? All right, let me just let, let me tell Mike to like get off my back and let's let's figure this out. And here I am now. If it wasn't for the people who saw something in me that I had given up on myself, I wouldn't be here. So now that I'm in law school and I'm thriving, I'm not just, you know, I'm not just making it by. I'm thriving in law school. Whenever someone tells me, oh, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. When it came to, like, career services, you know, they, they said, oh, you know, you can't get a paid job. But they, they go and they tell my, my, my white roommate, oh, there's a lot of paid jobs for your first summer. <laughs> Things like that that they don't really, like, acknowledge that they're saying. I said, watch me. And what did I do? I went and I worked for Verizon and got paid. So now in law school, I feel this new sense of uh, strength and power, I guess I would say, that if someone tells me no, I just watch me. I'll make it happen. I'll figure out a way. I'll make it happen, right? And that's why I'm here because I, I want to be who I needed when I was younger. And I want to be able to help people like those people who believed in me and helped me be where, bring me to where I am now. Thank you so much for that uh, for that robust response, Mateo. We really appreciate it. And I, we're just going to switch uh, gears a little bit as we're um, coming up upon. Uh, we're going to have some time, um, a little bit of extra time to see if we can respond. But the chat, Anna, just so that you know, I keep seeing all these wonderful questions and comments that are coming across the chat. Um, so we're just going to now kind of shift to another topic. And I also want to tie that in with the statistics that I had laid out for our audience this morning. So now we want to talk about, OK, what's next? Um, what actionable steps um, can we help our panelists in making this decision um, about pursuing a, a degree uh, in law school? So I want to um, ask and direct my questions to Professor Condon and to Issa in terms of um, what resources um, can students of color find um, that's out there, whether it's through um, information that the law school provides or through 
other internet research. Um, what resources are out there to support our, our students of color in their quest to go to law school? And I'll start with, uh, with Professor Condon. You know, I, I will um, add to what Dean Descolo, um starts with because I think she will be able to tell our students who are interested in the law school the, the exact places they should go for that information. And then I can talk about the law school's openness and um, desire to support all of those efforts. Uh, thanks, Professor Khan, and I'm happy to start. So um, shameless plug, um, Seton Hall Law has a great pre-legal program. Um, it's called uh, the Summer Institute for, for Pre-Legal Students, and this is for current college students, and it's a great opportunity for um, diverse college students, and this is open to all students who are EOF eligible. Um, so if you qualify for any EOF grants or loans in your undergraduate experiences, this program is open to you. It's a great five week course. Um, pre COVID, it was residential. Last summer, it was virtual. I think this summer we're holding out hope that we might be able to do a hybrid or go back to residential, but it's a great five week program that replicates the academic challenges of the first year of law school. Um, it teaches skills that um, certainly can be used to be a successful law student, but just generally to, to help you be successful in life. There's an LSAT prep component to it. And so it's a wonderful program to introduce you to law school, but also to help you build those skills that are really um, um, important for that. I'll make sure to put the link in the chat and I'll also send the link to Anna and Lori because I know that we'll be sending up a, a follow up and we actually have a pre-legal alum in the audience. So uh, Alejandra, I'm sure you can express all your um, opinions about the wonderful program as hard as it was because I know it's hard. I'm sure you found it fulfilling as well. I also encourage folks to take a look at every uh, to make connections with the admissions offices at some of the law schools that are within their areas or schools that you're interested in. Um, it'll help you find pathways like Le programs such as LEO. Uh, LEO is specific to Seton Hall Law, but there are a lot of law schools that have similar programs, right? So Widener, uh, Delaware Law and Widener, uh, Widener Delaware Law or Delaware Law Widener, they changed their name, I can't remember which one it is, um, has a wonderful TAPS program. Rutgers has MSP. So different law schools have different uh, pathway and transition programs. So make connections with admissions officers. And it doesn't even have to be with the school that you think you want to go to. I help students who are interested, certainly hopefully in Seton Hall, but also help students who um, are looking at law schools elsewhere. Another great resource is LSAC.org. LSAC is the clearinghouse for all law school applicants. In order to apply to law school, you must apply through LSAC. And they've, they're also the organization that administers the LSAT. So they have a lot of resources on how to prepare for the LSAT. They've partnered with Khan Academy recently and offer resources that way. They have a lot of um, past LSAT exams and the best way to practice and prepare for an LSAT is just doing practice tests over and over and over again. So the more access you have to these tests, the better, you're, um, uh, the better you can hone your skills. But also within LSAC.org, check out their Discover Law program. This is a great resource part of LSAC that helps introduce diverse students to law school. Um, and then the final resource, resource that I'll bring up is CLEO, um, the Council on Legal Education Opportunity or CLEOinc.org. It's a nonprofit organization founded in the 1960s to help expand opportunities for minority and low income students to attend law school. Um, I think they've seen over 25,000 of their alumni uh, join the legal community. So they're a great resource. They run numerous programs to help you prepare for college and they actually have specific programs for freshmen, which is the road to law school. For sophomores, the Super Saturdays pre-law seminar, they have the Junior Jumpstart, uh, the LSAT program, which helps prepare for the LSAT. But their flagship program is their Pre-Law Summer Institute, which is a rigorous uh, pre-COVID. Again, it was residential, and I think right now they're doing a hybrid or, or some version of that. 
but it's a, a rigorous program that's designed to help familiarize students um, with law school and to really hone the skills that can help them be uh, successful in law school. So those are some of the resources that are out there. I'll make sure again to share the link with Anna and, and Lori so that everybody who attended this call can um, review those. But those are the things that come to mind. Um, Professor Condon, I'll turn it over to you to share some resources that we offer students when they, they make their way to law school. And I knew that Dean Scullo, thank you very much. And, and I knew that was a good decision to invite Dean Desculo to, to answer that question because she's a um, fountain of useful and supportive information. I would just add that um, what I think is really important for, and I'm sorry there is an alarm that's going on and off in my building, but hopefully that won't interrupt this too much. Um, it's really important when you're um, deciding, you know, about the process of going to law school and then in choosing a specific law school mm -hmm. to get a feel for both the students that um, you you see yourself in and for the faculty. And so I know I was a first generation law student as well. Didn't really know much about the process, felt very naive about it. And I had different experiences when I went to different schools. Some were very welcoming and made me feel like I would feel comfortable um, saying I didn't know the answers to things and asking questions at a law school. And I uh, think that schools in particular that give you a sense of what it's like to be in the classroom early on is really helpful because you can start to picture yourself there and imagine what it would be like. Um, so keep that in mind. And I think we, of course, do a really great job with that at Seton Hall. But I think it's just important that you um, have experiences where you both um, can connect with other students and already see yourself developing a relationship with faculty members. As Leslie and Mateo pointed out, making connections in law school, both with your peers, but also with faculty and alum is really a big part of the process. And I think for um, students from unrepresented backgrounds, underrepresented backgrounds, that's even, um, frankly, a harder challenge because there's already a lot of systems in place that mm -hmm. serve to benefit people from um, traditional backgrounds. And so um, to give yourself a leg up, um, start to make those relationships early, but also look for a law school that cares about that. See if you get a, a sense that they care about your community from the moment you step foot in the door. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Condon. And just want to also uh, inform all of our attendees today that Anna will be following up with a resource uh, document for everyone who are uh, registered for today's event. It will be filled with a lot of useful information that our panelists have uh, mentioned here um, this morning. And my, my next question is for Professor Condon, and I think you hit on this, and this is a good segue to this question, in terms of recognizing that there are systems that are in place that sometimes are not always the most advantageous to travel for students of color. And I wanted to know from you, how do we study law today um, in the context of diversity? And, and, and especially particularly in light of all of the, the challenges that we have faced um, over this past year with, um, with social injustice and racial equity questions, how do we um, teach that and, 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 and really infuse that into the law school experience? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's really the ongoing challenge for the legal profession and for um, legal legal education. Um, I think, you know, part of the answer has to be about who is in the law school, both in terms of the professors um, and having a um, faculty and administration that represents America and is um, diverse and equitable. It has to do with having um, students in the classroom that have diverse backgrounds and experiences that um, lived experiences that are relevant to the study of law. And um, we're not just talking about the law as some neutral abstract principle, but as one that um, matters to, to people's lives in different ways. And then we have to, I think, challenge our professors to, to do a better job, frankly, of talking about issues of systemic racism and um, other inequality that impacts um, underrepresented groups and, and to think broadly about how the law is not always this um, perfect um, beacon of fairness and hope, but has actually been used to oppress many people. And so I think that the summer presented a lot of hope and I've seen some really good signs that these conversations are happening within 
um, the legal community and within um, academia in a way that they haven't happened before. Some of us have been engaged in these conversations for a long time, but it's a much broader conversation now. And I think from the top down, from the leader of the American Bar Association and other AALS, which is the Association of American Law Schools, the leadership there, are really challenging law school um, administration and faculty to do a better job. I know our faculty is engaged in ongoing trainings and pedagogy workshop, workshops and an, um, a review of our curriculum to think about how we do this. And then, of course, individual faculty members have to do this. So the, the main point here is that it's not on students to, to take up the burden of how do we you know, study um, the law in the context of um, aspiring to a more diverse and equitable profession, it has to be on the institution itself. And so um, I'm really proud that we're um, taking up that challenge. We have a lot of work to do, but I do think people are taking up that challenge. Great. Thank you, Professor Condon. And um, I know that we're approaching a little bit after 12, so we want to try to um, get maybe one more question in and to close this out um, for this wonderful panel. I just want to say this has been great um, hearing all of these wonderful experiences and trying to um, build each other up. And I, Leslie, I can't, that quote is, is in my head now, going with the wind. So we're going to continue to go with the wind as we get ready to close this out. But um, I do want to um, direct this 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 last piece um, to Judge Rigo and to Leslie. Um, so looking back on your experience as a law school student, what programs or services um, would you have benefited from? And Judge Rigo, I think this would be a great time for you to share your do's and don'ts with the audience. So I want to uh, let you give us your, your sage experience on that. Well, going back to what someone here has said, um, I, I believe it was Maria or Issa. Issa. Um, it's the academic buildup. Um, you real I would have would have loved to have the uh, Leo program that that residential program that Seton Hall has. Uh, I've been honored to be a judge at some of those uh, uh, the not the competitions but the exercises that they have with the writing with the with the arguments. Um, I've done them for quite a few years, um, maybe not in the last two, but um, I was very involved with those. And I've often said to myself, I wish I had that, um, that kind of thing. Um, just the, um, the ability to build relationships. Um, I was friendly, I'm, I'm, I, I could get along with people, but when you're the only one and everybody else looks very different and has very different experiences, life experiences, and you go home to completely different kind of, uh, of, a, of an environment. It's very difficult to continue that and go through that while you are in law school. Law, law school is, and it's not negative, it's just very different. It's different to whatever other um, and education you've experienced. It is, it is really something out there and it's on its own. So all of the help that you can, all of the whatever similarities you can bring in or, uh, or, or people provide for you makes it all the, dif all the difference. Um, it's, it's a group thing, but it's also a very individual thing. So you're, you're, you know, you're, you're really in, in, in very different types of waters. Uh, you can be a very good at, at swimming, but you may not be able to do the backstroke very well, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, um, it, it's different. And the more I find that the more um, training, the more uh, uh, camaraderie, the more things that are available to you, the better off. Um, I, was, I always looked different no matter where I was. So that was okay for me because I'd been used to that. Um, but when it comes to law school, 
you you just can't sit there and, and, and absorb everything. You have to be an active participant. And that's where the inclusion came in. And that's where I felt it most difficult because I didn't feel like like I could be included. I didn't feel like I was included and there was no other place. So um, to me, law school was extremely, extremely difficult. Um, some of the do's and don'ts, um, I find that you should look at yourself, look at the back, uh, your, your back experiences, how you've done in school, in undergrad, in high school, and what is it that you did in a particular area or for a preparation for a particular test that got you that good grade that you wanted and that you received? Because that skill you can carry over right into law school, even though it's a different uh, writing, it's a different style of presentation, but what you did to be able to get over it in other areas, you can just carry it over. Don't forget what skills you do bring mm -hmm. and what skills you do use to get yourself going. Um, the first year, you have to really manage your time. And it's the first year. And I say the first year because if you can make it through law school in the first year, Mm -hmm. You can make it through two, three, and four if you're in a four-year program. Mm -hmm. um, so it's time management. You, 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 you all have the brains. Intellectually, you can do this. Yeah, you can. It's trying to manage your time so that you can get that grunt work in. Um, you need to take... You need to read. Don't slack off on your reading assignments, on your cases. You need to stay up on that because that is something that maybe you can read the 10 cases, you know, but how much are you going to absorb just because you didn't do it in time? Mm -hmm. You know, you must take, uh, this one is a, a personal one, but I find that I take, copious notes. You take copious notes, whether you type them in or you put them in, you know, however you take your notes, but just take it Be and have it down because you're going to get hit with so many other things that you're bound to forget something. And if you have it there, you can say, ah, yeah, forgot about this. Okay. Take copious notes. Um, there is no coasting, and that's what my note says. <laughs> there is no coasting through that first year. There just isn't, okay? You might be able to do so in your third year, not even in your second, okay? Another thing is do form a study group. Now, I know it's difficult with uh, COVID now, and with everybody doing so many things, even last year before COVID really was into place. It's not like you can sit at home on your computer and do your own thing. You really need a study group and find a study group that is um, that has more or less your same time of operating. You know, we have morning people, we have afternoon people, we have late at night people. Um, so, you know, find a study group. To me, that was most helpful because a study group and discussing the matters with your peers gives you another look. And there's a reason why that we have law firms, okay? <laughs> because you, you really need to have that other side, that look, so you can prepare for your arguments. All right, and be prepared for the arguments you get back. Um, you also need a law group, a study group, because you need to find cohorts, you know, uh, uh, people that can give you that TLC, that tender loving care, that um, 
you know, you're not going to find anywhere else, even if it's your friend from like grammar school. OK, mm -hmm. you need someone like that. And usually you'll find that in your study group. Another thing is get to know your professors. OK, do you need help? Go to them. Just go to them. I found every professor once I went to them and explained to them I'm in need of this or that, they would bend over backwards, even in my day that I was so-called imposter. OK, <laughs> um, but you, you, you need to go. You need to go. Um, ask questions, even if you think, you know, so and so with a the big VP from, you know, Chase Manhattan or wherever. Um, and may seem dumb, but <laughs> no, ask the question. OK, always remember that. If you're going to go out and, and law and practice law, you're going to have people that that don't know what you know, okay? And they were going to ask that same allegedly stupid question. So that gives you, you know, it it puts you in the same realm of the people that you someday may represent, okay? And they may be thinking of those questions. Um, be physically fit mm. um, because I, ha I have a very good friend. He's a, a top lawyer at Paul Weiss who always kept himself fit. Uh, and he said, when you're on a case, it's like running a marathon. So I, I think physically you don't have to be, you know, a bodybuilder and all that stuff. Keep yourself fit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that heart will just go, 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 and you would think you're running, <laughs> but you're not. Okay. So you really should be physically fit. Um, when you uh, be, have your ears, eyes, and ears open all of the time, listen to conversations. Who's saying what? Uh, conversations with your professors. That way you can find out about internships, externships, uh, uh, jobs, and connections that you could very well make when you're done. Okay. Um, get to know not just your first year students, but your second and your third year students. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's your beginning of your professional network. Mm -hmm. You really need to do that. Um, the don'ts. If you are struggling, you're not making the grades, OK? Don't bury your head in the sand. Don't say, oh, I can't do this. I just, you know, con law, I'm, I, I just can't, OK? No. Go to that con law professor and say, look it. And I'm sorry, I say, what the hell is this all about? I just don't <laughs> get it. OK. And if he or she is a professor that pr takes pride in their work, they will help you or they will give you things to read, show you examples, take you to such cases. Be and also, because once you bury your head in the sand, it's very difficult to get out. Very mm -hmm. difficult to get out. OK. Always um, take practice tests. Take mm -hmm. every chance you get, you take a practice test. These are the things that I didn't do and I'm telling you to, to do. OK. Um, make sure that you practice your writing. OK. Take those practice writing um, samples and exams, things, tests that they have now. Um, they may have had them then, but I certainly didn't know about it. Um, so, so that you're familiar. You're familiar. It's really did it just pick up the pen or the and stop start going? Okay. Um, don't be scared. 
you can do this. You can do this. OK, you've done all of the hard things. If you got into law school, you're you're partly there. You're halfway there and you can continue. OK. Be disciplined and that goes in with being physically fit because that takes a discipline. You must be disciplined. OK. Um. You can do. The quantity work. OK, OK. It's the I'm sorry, you can do the quality work. You can do this. It's the quantity that makes it difficult because there's just so much. But if you're disciplined and you get your time. You know, straightened out. There's no reason why you can't finish law school and finish very well. Right. Um, something else that I didn't do, I, I suggest that you do go do the clinic work, whatever mm -hmm. clinic there is. When I was in school, it was a landlord tenant clinic. There was the clinic that was tied in with the legal services program. If you want to be a practicing lawyer, I mean, practice out there, uh, get involved as soon as you can in law school in those areas and get involved in any other area. If you want to do health law, then get involved in that club, that association, look into what's available and just already start the lingo in your head, start the thinking, start making those connections. Uh, the other last thing is. Find yourself a mentor. Mm. A mentor and sometimes. Um, the mentor will come to you. But if the mentor doesn't come to you, you go look for one. Mm -hmm. In whatever in whatever it could be a professor mentor, it could be a practicing lawyer. It cannot be a practicing lawyer, but find yourself a mentor. Uh, since being out of law school so long ago mm -hmm. and being a, a practicing lawyer, I have mentored, I have mentored many students. And as a mentor, it's very fulfilling. It's it's wonderful. And uh, my mentees tell me that they have benefited and I've seen it. And these these could be a relationship that goes on for many, many years across many waters. Uh, but I think it's key that you find a mentor. Go look for one or make yourself accessible so one will come to you. Uh, um, that's Judge it. Rico, I just have to say that your tips are extremely yes. popular in the chat. Yes. We will, whatever paper you're using, we will need you to type that for us. For just phone. my notes. <laughs> if you're Anna, looking, that's you to type point. your notes so that we can send everybody your do's and don'ts of law school. Thank you so much for sharing. I was actually going to mention that, Anna. That would be a great uh, uh, document to add to your resource um, uh, guidelines. So that would be great. Um, I, I just want to thank you, Judge Rigo, so much for those pearls of wisdom because um, I can tell you that even through my law school experience that those really are key things, do's and don'ts. Um, I think that um, we can all relate to that um, and hopefully apply that not only to law school, but in life as well, too, in That's general. True. So we we thank you for that. We really do. Um, trying to be mindful of our time on our panel, but I do want to um, just ask Leslie because and Leslie and Mateo, who I don't know what else you could put on your resumes at this point. Um, of all that you're doing inside and outside of the law school community. But Leslie, is there any programs that you think would be helpful at this point um, uh, for the law school to think about creating or developing for uh, for students that are there now and incoming students as well too? 
I also had my list of three things I wanted <laughs> to impart on everyone. But okay. I think, oh, quickly with regards to programming. Um, actually, it's part of my list, so I'll <laughs> let me start. I have three things for everyone. Okay. First is be authentic. Be true to who you are. Don't think that you need to fill a certain mold to stand out. Your diversity is a beautiful thing. Don't go to judge receptions and think, I read the New York Times on the weekend and I uh, drink green tea every day. That's not what you do. You know, being who you are will get you jobs. People want to work with people that they like. When I attend a judge's receptions, if a judge has a great pair of shoes, I'm like, I love your shoes. Mm -hmm. And we will bond over fashion, what it is like to be a woman, you know, who cares about those type of things. You know, that's what got me my summer job. Literally, I I made that connection. I didn't have to talk about being, you know, jobs or et cetera. We just bonded over who we are and what we like. So don't think you need to change or in your essays, don't write what you think admissions wants to hear. Mm -hmm. Write about who you are, what you love. If you love anime and anime is what inspired you to apply to law school because you saw something, talk about that. You know, I've, we want diversity here. You know, we want different perspectives. Okay, that's one. Two is, as a lot of you, we all spoke, we're all first generations. We've all internalized not asking for help. Unlearn that in law school. Unlearn that now. You are not alone. Ask for help. The worst thing that can happen is no. And you, you know, the worst thing that you happen is that you stay exactly where you are, or they say yes, and you gain that job, that mentorship, that internship, whatever it is, which applies to the question now, apply for everything, especially as women. I saw there are a lot of women in this panel. We tend statistically to not apply for jobs unless we feel we have every single prerequisite. Apply for things that you think you're even unqualified for. Apply for that law review, apply, try out for the mock trial team, try out for the moot court team. If your local community is doing a mentorship program, apply, apply and try out for everything. And lastly, with seeking mentors, I can't stress how important that is. Don't think that mentors are always people that are older than you. Something that I didn't do that I'm, gonna, that I'm trying to be better about this year, talk to everyone before you need them. Make genuine connections. Ask people about how their day are. You know, I'm same age as Janisha and Genesis, but I consider them mentors. A mentor isn't always someone that's an academic mentor. It can be a professional one. It can be a spiritual mentor. It can be a culinary mentor. Mm -hmm. Mentors exist on every facet yeah. of your life. There's There are several pillars of identity that we all have. Look at everything around you, not just, okay, how's this person gonna benefit me in jobs, but talk to everyone. LinkedIn, also after you meet everyone, send thank you notes, connect with okay. them. A quick five minutes of your day, hey, I saw you today. I really loved what you said. I hope we can connect and talk in the future. That's it, you know, just make sure that after you connect with them, you maintain the relationship to fruition. Don't just send that message and leave it up to the universe. You know, every season, if you finally got into law school, hey, I just want to let you know, I finally got into my dream school. Hey, I saw that you're going to speak at blank panel. I can't wait to hear you speak. And that's it. That's all my three points. Thank you so much, Leslie. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to say this has been wonderful, um, an amazing time. We actually um, went over a little bit because we were having such an organic discussion about this, and I really appreciate everyone's time and attention. I want to thank uh, all of our panelists, Dean DeSculo, uh, Judge Rigo, Professor Condon, Mateo, 
uh, Diaz, Leslie Velos. A special thank you to Anna Campo Verde and Janisa Romero Rodriguez for putting this program together, for asking me to participate. I, I tell you, I'm honored um, to serve as the moderator today. Um, just want to say all of these pearls of wisdom, that's what they are. They're here and they're designed to help you um, make a decision about pursuing law school. Remember, law school doesn't necessarily mean you have to practice. You can use that for whatever good that you think you might fit in, whether it's working in HR, whether it's working in diversity, whether it's trying a case, whether it's writing a brief, whether it's working for um, a corporation, you can navigate um, your career um, and your options of, of what you see best fits your personality and the passion that you have to do good um, in this area. So I just wanna take that time and um, and say thank you to everyone today. I am going to turn this over to Anna, who's going to close us out. I hope everyone continues to stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, social distance, um, and keep doing what you're doing. And in the words of Leslie Velos, we're gonna go with the wind and I'm gonna turn it over to Anna. Thank you so much, Laurie, and thank you so much to everyone who participated as part of this conversation. It's an important conversation to have. We had a lot of activity in the chat. If we did not get to your question, no worries. We will send your question to the corresponding panelist, um, and we'll hopefully get you an answer within a couple of days. For everyone who registered for this event, you will be getting a follow-up document with some resources, um, including Judge Rigo's tip sheets. Um, so thank you again to everyone who participated. If you'd like to attend future events, just you know, keep an eye on our website. We are the Latino Institute um, at Seen Hall University. And then um, Janisha dropped into the chat box the different student organizations that are um, at the law school. And in addition to that, they also drop LALSA's um, Instagram handle. So again, thank you guys so much. Thank you to all the law school students here today. Thank you to all those interested. And like Lori said, please be safe and hopefully we'll see you in person very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.